to do this. This is my highest honor of the day right now. She is a premium prophetic voice, not to just this house, but to the nations. She's a beautiful mother. She's a wonderful, wonderful person in her own right. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please help us and join that is coming to the stage, the mother of this house, Dr. V. Woo. Let's go ahead and give God some honor, give God some worship, give Jesus our highest praise, our highest affection, our highest devotion. All eyes are on you, Father. All eyes are on you, Papa. We love you, Jesus. We extol you, God. We glorify you. Oh, Jesus, you're so worthy, so worthy of our affection. Amen. Amen. Bless you. You may be seated may be seated. Thank you, Father. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Worship is not about the worship team. It's about the collective of us gathering and making a decision to lift up the name of Jesus. And what an honor it is to worship him. What an honor it is to cry out to him. What an honor it is to bow down. What an honor it is to lift up our hands. What an honor it is to dance. What an honor it is to sing at the top of our lungs. Not only because he's worthy, not only because he's good, because there are people who cannot. There are people who cannot lift up their voice because someone is listening outside and will slaughter them for worshiping the same Jesus we take for granted. Not because we, he is worthy of it, but because people have paid a great price for us to be able to gather and worship. So when we worship the Lord, when we bless God, it's not just in reverence to him. It is also on thank you for those that are risking their lives, those that have risked their lives. We call it an honor and a privilege to be here in America, to be able to easily worship God. Yeah, thank you, Lord. All right, we're going into the fear of the Lord. We are on our third week. Today I'm going to be talking about the honor roll, how to honor others, who we should honor. Quickly, Bible study starts the first week in May. We don't want you to show up on Wednesday, this Wednesday. Is it this Wednesday? No. It's the first week in May, all right? So we're going to be here, and my wonderful, your wonderful pastor, I was going to say my wonderful husband, said we're going to study Solomon's prayer. I said, Jesus, where is that in the Bible? I've got to, <laughs> I've got to find it because I'm going to be on the couch here with him having those conversations. So if you want to find something that you did not know was in the scriptures, talk to this man, all right? We're going to do a deep study in Solomon's Prayer. How many of y'all know Solomon's Prayer? Is it just me? Okay, Mama Sh Okay, we got four of you. Okay, I don't feel so bad. I mean, I've been walking with Jesus a long time. And I ain't tired yet. But I had no idea where Solomon's Prayer was. All right. So we're going to be starting May, May for uh, that. And then shout out to all of our small group leaders. This is their last week, 12 weeks, 12 weeks of opening their home and creating a space to minister to you and love on you and organizing food and praying for you and checking on you. You guys are the real MVPs. And so we are very, very grateful that we're not the only shepherds in this house. We may be the lead shepherds, but God is raising up people that have a heart to care for others and walk alongside them in the journey. So we only need like four more uh, because so many of them said they're coming back, which is another like amazing, amazing thing. And so please, if you feel like you're called to serve in any way and you wanna lend a hand, um, let them know in the back. 
All right, we have established what it means to honor God, right? We've talked about it for the last several weeks. We know that it means to reverence him. It, we know that it means to fear him but not be afraid of him. It means to respect his name, to respect his power, to respect his grandeur, to not just live any kind of way knowing that he is God, to understand that he is kind, but he's also sovereign, to understand that he is gentle, but he's also powerful, really understanding the fullness of God. And because we have an awareness of who he really is, then in return, we reverence him, we honor him, and it is out of a knowledge of his character. And so today we want to talk about how the fear of God, when we've mastered the fear of God, the natural next step is to honor others. You can't say I honor God, but I don't honor other people. Because the fear of God breeds honor, not only to him, but for us to honor those that he loves and for us to honor those that he honors. So before I, I go into that, I want to quickly give you guys this. I got a little crazy in the, in the first uh, service. I'm going to breeze through this because it's not the, the meat of my sermon. But these are the benefits of the fear of the Lord, all right? The benefits of the fear of the Lord, you can take a screenshot, go check out those verses later on, um, adds length to your life, teaches a person wisdom, enables a person to avoid evil. And I worked backwards because when we honor the Lord, then we, uh, we know what pleases him. We know what is evil and we know what is wickedness. And so we make a decision not to partake in those things. We make a decision not to be part of those things. And because we make that decision, we're now walking in wisdom. Those that walk in wisdom know the way of the Lord and they obey it. They know the way of the Lord and they obey it. And when we obey it, guess what happens? We have long life. I gave that example of, you know, if you're going out to the club and then there's trouble at the club and you got to jump in a garbage can. I always share this story because um, my friend had to hide when there was a shootout, right? That wasn't wise. They probably shouldn't have been there in the first place if they had learned to just avoid evil. And if you do those things, right, you have long life. But when you don't and you find yourselves in these compromising positions, you find your life looking shorter and shorter, right? When we are wise, we choose to keep our body to ourselves until we have a spouse because it is wickedness to fornicate. It is wickedness to just sleep around. And because we fear the Lord, we don't do it. But guess what? You now have long life. You don't have to be checking pregnancy tests every month. You don't have to be worried about an STD or something like that because you've chosen wisdom, because you've abstained from wickedness, because you fear the Lord. Amen? The fear of the Lord always will lead to life. Don't let them lie to you. Don't let them lie to you and make you feel like living a life of reverence, living a life of honor, living a life in which we check in with the Holy Spirit before we make a decision or check in with the Holy Spirit before we, you know, take a big leap is, is being controlled. The truth is when you think you're in control, you're really out of control. And I would rather submit my whole being into the leadership of Jesus than to try to figure it out on my own. And then it brings wealth and honor. Proverbs 22, 4 says, humility is the fear of the Lord. So humility is not you acknowledging how amazing you are or not acknowledging how good you're at something. No. Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. That's not humility. Humility is not taking glory that should be given to the Lord. And so I can say thank you because I have a nice dress. I can't say, oh, that was God. That wasn't God. He, I mean, he's not wearing the dress. I'm wearing the dress, right? But I don't take that uh, compliment and now begin to be puffed up or begin to be prideful. I say, God, thank you for letting me go to Ross and find that dress for $7.99 or wherever you went, right? I saw that meme where uh, the girl says, okay, I'm not going to tell anybody where I got this dress, right? And someone be like, hey, girl, nice dress. They'd be like, it was $7.99 at Ross, right? We love to tell a good deal. Humility is saying, thank you, Jesus, for leading me that way. Those who fear the Lord have a secure fortress and refuge for their children. 
And I was telling them earlier, it's great to have the 401k and the trust and the LCC and the this and the that, but there is no greater security than you fearing the Lord for your children. They may not be fearing the Lord right now, but your prayers and your devotion to the Father rise up as an incense and you can secure their destiny because you have honored the Lord. You have something to cash in with the Lord when the kids are looking like they're not going to walk with God. Those who fear the Lord are blessed. We're living the blessed life. Those that fear the Lord are to be praised. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm doing what my reasonable service is. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, which is reverence you because you're worthy of the reverence and the honor. But then you turn back in return and people give me praise because I live for God. And I gave an example of Sophia, our friend Sophia Ruffin. She shared the post about being on a plane and someone came up to her and was saying, man, who are you? You look really familiar. And are you, who are you? She said, well, I'm a comedian. He said, no, 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 you're not a comedian. You got to be a minister or something like that. And you look like you don't curse. You look like you don't curse. The fear of the Lord and the glory of the Lord on her life allowed others to praise her lifestyle. And what's so phenomenal about that is if you knew her history, right? Like if you knew where God came from, but is your life in such a place and you living out of that fear of the Lord, something that's praiseworthy for those who don't even know God. Can people look at your life and want to know your God because of the level of reverence and honor that you walk in and you carry with the Lord? And then they lack nothing. And we'll go into this a little bit in August when we study finances and, and wealth. But there is something about the fear of the Lord that gives us wisdom and strategies to gain wealth. To those who fear the Lord, this is the last list. And today we got lots of lists, y'all, right? You guys already know I'm a, a list queen if you follow me on social media. So just get your phone ready to take pictures. To those who fear the Lord, God confides in them. You can be prophetic and not fear the Lord. You can be prophetic and have revelation that is very surface level. Now, to those of us who are not prophetic, you may feel really deep. They know phone numbers. They know this. They know that. You can operate out of a gifting and not out of the fear of the Lord. It is those that walk in the fear of the Lord that God confides in, that gives mysteries, that gives revelation, and not just this woo-woo, foo-foo mysteries about angels and all of that. No, 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 no. Revelation and mysteries about his heart and his depth. And so the fear of the Lord is an invitation into revelation. The fear of the Lord is not just an invitation into friendship. It's an invitation of you becoming a confidant to the Lord. He can give you information, and because you fear him and you honor him, he knows you're not going to use it against people. He knows you're not going to use it to manipulate a situation. He knows you're going to pray about it. He knows you're going to know how to steward it. And that's why when you're prophetic, it's very important that you spend the first three years really learning how to deliver a word. Not just receive it, delivering it. Who do I deliver it to? How do I deliver it to them? When do I deliver it to them? I sat under Emmy Star, uh, Emma Stark last week, and, and she gave an hour and a half prophetic word about what the nations are getting ready to go into. But you could tell the level of maturity in how she navigated the word that comes from being able to spend time with the Lord and walking in wisdom. All right, I'm slowing down again. It makes his covenant known to them. The covenant is known to them. You could know God and not benefit from the covenant. His eyes are on them. He never takes his eyes off of you when you walk in the fear of the Lord. It is possible for you to walk yourself outside of the hedge of protection because you don't fear God. It is possible for you, meaning God is omnipresent, so he's everywhere. But there's a difference. There's a difference when my kids were little and we're in the mall or somewhere and I have my eyes on them than when they're running around in the store and I know they're in the store, I'm just not sure where. Right? Now, God knows exactly where you are, but that you, when, when, you're, when his eyes are on them, that means he's looking at your every move and every step, not to judge you, not to punish you, but because as we're going to see, he delights in you. He delights in walking with you. My God, have we gone, where we go, can God go? 
The places that we're entertaining, the people that we're fellowshipping with, are these places that God would be willing to continuously go to. He has compassion on them. He loves them, sends his righteousness to them. Those that fear God, God sends his righteousness. I'm, I, I want to be righteous. I want to be upright. And we do that because we love him, but he's willing to help you love him. He's willing to help you live for him. I, may, I was talking about earlier, you may, you know, be upset. I didn't get that phone call from that person. It could be the Lord aiding you in righteousness. Oh, I didn't get that job. That relationship didn't work out. The Lord is helping you, aiding you in righteousness. He knows you better than you know yourself. And especially when it comes to relationships, it's like our brains turn off. We always joke when we stop seeing people in church consistently, we know they got a boyfriend or something, right? Or a girlfriend. It's true, unless they're coming to the church with them. But the Lord delights in sending righteousness so you don't fall. Like, he is aiding you to live right. And then he delights in them. All right, let's go into the honor role. The scriptures gives us a list of those that we are to honor. I'm going to give you guys about seven. Two of them, Pastor Soso is going to really go into it next week in detail. And so I'm going to speed past them. But the first one is honor God. We have studied that. We, we are learning how to honor him with our life, with our words, with our conduct, with our behaviors, right? The next one is honoring your mother and father. Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. This is one of the only commandments with a promise, that when you honor your mother and father, your days in the land are long. The Enduring Word commentary says, this command is wise and it's good. Because honor for parents is an essential building block for the stability and health of a society. And so we are in a generation right now where honor is uh, derailing, it's degrading, it's, it's falling apart. And honor is basically given when we feel like we have received honor. And I was sharing earlier about eight nations like Asia and even some African nations where you would not even think Think about putting your mother in a nursing home. In Asia, they live the longest uh, uh, people right now. They live 100 years, 105 years, and you will find that every family has a room in their house where they keep their mom and dad no matter how old, no matter how senile, no matter how ever. Now, we have gotten so smart here that we say, well, I am too busy, and so I'm going to throw her in the nursing home somewhere. Oh, I don't have the time to manage. I know it's all right. I'm going to put her in this corner, right? And the Lord is telling us here that there is a reward for honor. And some of y'all say, well, you don't know my mother. You don't know how crazy she is. You don't know my dad. You don't know that he wasn't there for me. Honor is not dependent on the fact that you've been honored. Honor is dependent on the fact that you are honorable. I was telling them earlier, we already had a conversation. She's going to have another house next to our house. There'll be a bridge for us to walk over there and check on her when she's 99. We'll get her a nurse, right? We work now so that we can honor our mother right? That, that we cannot be so focused on building and taking care of ourselves. And the person that wiped your butt when you were a baby is now in a nursing home by somebody white, abusing them. And not every nursing home is bad, right? But what breaks my heart, and there's some situations where you got to put them in a nursing home, but some people are in nursing homes and their families have not visited them in years, in years. How can we say that we're believers and we haven't seen our parents in years. We haven't visited them. We have discarded them. The ones that took care of us. The ones that, that carried us. I know that every situation is different. I was talking to somebody earlier. And I'm going to tell you how to honor your parents. Even if they're difficult. Even if they're bipolar. There is still a responsibility for you to honor your mother and your father. If you have access to them. To honor one's parents includes to prize them, 
to care for them and to show respect or reverence to them. Reverence means I'm not just going to talk any kind of way to my mama, even to this day, right? Like, I, I, you, I'm not afraid she's going to hit me, but she still may because she's a little gangster. But um, <laughs> it's just a holy respect, a holy reverence. Even to my, my dad who raised us, who didn't always make the best decisions and wasn't always there. I, I'm, I'm really trying to paint a pretty picture here. There still has to be a level of respect because I fear God. Not even because I fear my mama. I fear my daddy. I fear God. Therefore, I am not just going to run my mouth any kind of way. The command is given to children, but not only for while they are children. This is not a popular doctrine in our modern day. Right? We worship youth. And we discard the old. And we're going to read another section on honoring those that are older than us. But God has a promise that is connected to those that carried you. I know some of you guys may not have been raised by your mom or dad. Maybe it was an aunt or an uncle. Some of you guys may have even gone through the foster system. And then you had to go through gateway to freedom and heal those mother and father wounds. And then your dad comes back from nowhere acting like, he, like nothing ever happened. There's still a place for honor. There's still a place for honor. I know this can be really hard. Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with the promise that they may be well with you and may be living long on the earth. That it may be well with you and you may live long in the earth. So what happens when you have parents that don't have no sense, right? They don't walk with the Lord. They're probably struggling in their own stuff. Maybe they're on drugs. You know, people always ask me this, like, do I, how do I honor a parent that is ungodly? How do I honor a parent who doesn't know God themselves? Just because they don't know God, it doesn't excuse you from honor. And we're going to look at that. Children should obey their parents as they're growing up. Children should obey their parents as long as as they're also dependent on them. So let's talk about this first, then we'll go into the honor. Because a lot of times people think that, well, I'm 17, I'm 18, I don't need to obey my parents. If you live in their house, if you drive their car, if you're drinking the water that they pay for every single month, you obey your parents. If you were that grown, you would move out and have your own address. And so if you are dependent on someone that is caring for you, I know y'all ain't hate this type of old school teaching in a long time, but that's okay. If you are living with someone and they are de you are depending on them, there has to be a level of obedience. There has to be a level of honor. Honor is saying, okay, you said I got to come home at 12. I don't like coming home at 12, but I'm in your house, so I'm going to be home at 12. I don't like doing dishes. I got a girl. She be washing my clothes. I, don't, I hope she's not. But you're going to do dishes in here. I don't care what she washes, right? Because you're living in my house. Now, when you grow up, your parents don't need obedience. They need honor. And we're going to talk about that. So we do this, and obedience is important for no other reason but the fact that it's right. It's just, it's right. It's the right thing to do. We live in a generation right now that we've got to explain everything. Even us as pastors, we get tired sometimes. Because everybody wants information. Everybody wants an explanation. Everybody wants to understand. But there was a season and a time that when your parents said this, they meant that. There's also a place, even scripturally, when your pastors say this, they mean this. We don't like it because we don't want to be controlled. We don't want to be in environments where people are abusing us. So all of us pastors in this generation are tiptoeing everywhere. We got to measure our words. We got to watch how we preach because somebody's going to be offended or hurt. But what it is is doing is building a cycle of people that don't understand honor. As you grow, things shift, right? The adult child does not owe the parent obedience. The adult child who is on their own, living their life, doing whatever they want to do, your parents should counsel you, they should advise you, but you can do whatever you want to do. And that's what I tell some parents, like they've been praying, they've been advising. I'm like, look, they, they're, they're on their own. Let God deal with them. 
let them figure it out, right? There's a, there's a place where you've got to let that go because they don't owe you obedience anymore. And if you're a parent and a child is on their two feet and they're living their life and you're still trying to make them obey you, you're controlling. It's not about obedience, it's control. So they don't owe you obedience anymore, but what they owe you is honor. They owe you honor. If your parents don't know God, it is important to make sure that you have parents in the Lord. Ephesians 6, 1 says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And so not all of our parents may have been in the Lord or are in the Lord. And that's why you need mentors, you need pastors, you need other spiritual um, small group leaders, you need people that are more mature than you, that have gone further than you, that can help give you godly instruction, not their opinion. Some of y'all need to start asking your friends, where is that in the Bible? Because the type of advice y'all be taking, I'd be like, who told you to do that? Like, that doesn't even make any sense, right? And so you want godly people who have some maturity, who have some depth, who have some life. And you want to make sure that you're honoring them in the Lord, right? But honor, uh, obeying them in the Lord, but honor when it comes to your parents <clears throat> looks like this. Oh, my computer just did something funky. Let's see. All right. These are some of the ways that you can honor your parents in a, in a practical, practical way. We can put that list up there. The first thing is speak, speak well of them. They don't deserve it, but they also don't deserve you. My, my dad used to love this word, lambasting them, right? Like just he's talking about them anywhere you go. He loved big words, African guy, right? Just... So you speak well of them. I know that there's a lot of hurt. My bio dad, I didn't get to start talking to him till I was 28, right? I, I knew of him, but we didn't have any relationship. At 28, he came in, you know, dad, I'm dad, I'm dad. I'm like, okay, we got to take it easy, take it easy. Um, I'm glad you're here, but we, we've got to warm up to this. But it would have never been out of a disrespectful tone. Because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. Even if he just, you know, helped donate some, you know what I'm, you know. Um, <laughs> just the fact that you are here because of them, they deserve honor. They may not have done it right. They may not have been perfect, but they still deserve a level of honor. So you speak well of them. And it can be difficult. You can be angry. And there's a way that you can uh, express displeasure and not shame and bring um, ridicule upon people. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, if I can hurry up. The next one is that you care for them. I was sharing earlier how it blessed my heart so much to watch Papa Woody and Mama Sharon care for their dad, even with dementia. I mean, that is difficult. And I know there's some people in this house that are dealing with that, but there is something about saying, I am not going to put you away somewhere for somebody else to deal with you, but I am going to deal with you day in, day out. When you remember me, when you don't remember me, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to clean you. I'm going to bring you to church. I'm going to, and they were still serving the whole time that they were doing this. That's what honor looks like. Nobody said honor is easy. It's right. It's right. Just because something is right doesn't mean it's going to be easy. The same way just because something is God doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It's the right thing to do. And I know that God is going to honor them for that. And many of you others have done the same. You want to treat them with kindness and gentleness. And this could be hard, especially if your parent is just like you. You think it's them, but it's because they're just like you. Right? And so you guys butt heads and you go back and forth and you want to quickly just be like, oh, she's so crazy or oh, he's so stubborn. Look at yourself a little bit, right? But there's a way that even in that you have to use restraint because that's what humility is. And where you just want to slam the door because I've said one other crazy thing. You say, okay, God, we'll talk later, mom, because right now we're not seeing eye to eye. Right? Okay, because I don't want to dishonor you. I'm going to leave right now. Right? And so learning how to allow the Holy Spirit to use control so that you can bless those that are difficult to bless. Honor your parents. There is a reward for it. Forgive them and figure out how you can care for them and how you can be there for them. It, it, it may not be, you know, buying them their dream house or whatever, but send a monthly package or at least call every single week. They may be talking nonsense. And so after 10 minutes, you set your timer, say, mom, it was good talking to you. I'll talk to you later. There's a way to even honor them within boundaries. 
There's no reason for us to not honor our mother and father. The next one is um, honor those that are older than us. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. That's what he tells us. Like, you shall do this. Like, I was talking about earlier, like, it doesn't make sense to me that we, we get, you know, in our culture, someone gets on a bus and they're older than us, and we'd be like, well, I got on here first. I still got two miles to go. And you say that you're a believer. Or simply, we, sit, we talk about this all the time, we have Papa Sean and Papa Woody lifting tables and all of this, and the young men are in the corner talking. Like, you, you don't even think to think, okay, let me stop what I'm doing. These guys have lived way longer than me. Let me pick up a table. Let me put away a chair. If your mama didn't teach you, like, I'm teaching you now. Like, this is a command. The Lord says that we are to honor the gray head and honor the face of an old man. I know we don't like it because we're in a generation that is very me, 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 right? And if it doesn't please me and if it doesn't feel good to me. But if you want to be a man, you need to learn honor, men. You need to learn honor. I grew up in Africa, and I don't think they knew this verse here in the village, but if you let young people are sitting there and an older person walks in, we all stand up. We all stand up. We don't sit there and have them talking down to us like this. We stand up. We honor them. We look at them, right? And every culture is different. But the culture of the kingdom leads the way. So I don't care if you didn't do it in your house. If the Bible is telling us to do it because it's a sign of the fear of the Lord, then I'm going to do it. I give an example with Mama Donna. If Mama Donna comes in after me and I have a seat, I am giving up my seat for her because she's older than me. And she's going to say, no, you're my pastor. You sit. I said, no, you're older. You sit. But I will not just sit there and say, well, I'm the pastor, so I'm going to take the seat. Pastor Soso all the time, he says, if we have overflow, we'll give up our seats. Like, what's that? We would rather honor our guests and let them have a seat than we sit there. <laughs> honor. Honor. It's always thinking of the other person. It's always extending yourself beyond your needs and what you desire. Honor church leaders. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Double honor. This is where it talks about double honor. It's not even just a level of honor, especially those who labor in preaching and in teaching. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, respect, reverence, especially those who work is preaching and teaching. So Pastor Soso is going to go into this next week. He's going to break it down. Do not not show up for church, okay? Uh, because I told you what, <laughs> what he's going to be talking about. Because this is going to bless your life. If we can master this, it doesn't matter how old you are. If we can master these things, these simple, simple little keys, because some of us have been fasting and praying and we don't see any breakthroughs, it could be because we have a lack of honor. It could be because the fear of the Lord is only there because we think we're going to be punished and we don't have a full reverence of the Lord. Everything is not super spiritual. Some things are very practical. The Lord is telling us here what to do and how to treat one another and how to respond to another. So this, he's going to talk about how to honor those that are older than us. I think someone went into my document and highlighted it. All right. Okay. There we go. The next one is honor others who serve Christ faithfully. So this is not just those that are above you. This is your teammate. This is the parking lot attendants out there. This is those that are taking care of the babies today. This is those that are walking around with tissues during worship and making sure that you're covered and, and you have tissue. If he, um, Philippians 2.29 says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. So they sent to him to minister to the apostle to take care of him, and now he's sending him back. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard he was ill. He's worried that they're worried because he got sick, right? Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow after sorrow. So God rescued him, he was sick, he didn't die, and there was no other death. Verse 28, I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So, 
receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. I shared how I grew up in a church that was, we had missionaries all over the world, and I remember when the missionary would come in from Pakistan or India or wherever, we would have, you know, a Sunday evening service, and they would share their slides and everything that God did there. We would have food for them. They wouldn't have to worry about where they were going to sleep. They didn't worry about what they were going to eat because they had been in the field nearly dying for the sake of the gospel. We were so excited to create a space for them to be able to rest because they were co-laborers. Now, some of our co-laborers may not be out there, you know, being almost, uh, you know, pierced with, with swords and all those things. But someone may have lost somebody, but they still show up to greet you at the door. Somebody may be struggling with their kids, not listening to them, but they're still willing to teach your kids and be kind and patient to them. Someone may be struggling with sickness in their body, but they still get up here and they lead worship. And what they the scripture is saying is that you need to take note of those that labor alongside you and you need to honor them. You need to tell them, I see you. Thank you for your work. Don't assume this is what they're supposed to do. We're so entitled like, well, that's what they're supposed to do. That's what they signed up to do. They could say no, but for the sake of Christ, they say yes. They say yes on Sunday mornings. They say yes on Friday nights. They say yes when it's raining. They say yes when nobody shows up. They're constantly saying yes. And some of you guys who said serve, serve. No, nah, I don't want to serve. I just, I just want to go to church. I'm not ready yet. That's fine, but could you at least show honor to those that are willing to do the job? Honor those that serve beside you. Pastor Soso, when we, when we have different people speak that are from this church, that are sons and daughters, he said, you better treat them the same way that you treat us. Figure out what they want to eat for breakfast. Make sure they have water. Make sure they have an assistant. There's no treatment that you're going to give us. And then those that are also willing to labor. This was really funny because uh, we used to get these essential waters. And um, they're like, you know, the worship team, they, they, I'm like, they can drink Fiji, you know. He said, no, get them essential waters too, right? Like, if we're drinking essential waters, they're singing more than we're preaching. But there shouldn't be this hierarchy of honor because somebody's on the worship team and another person cleans the bathrooms. As a matter of fact, those deserve even more honor, the parts that are unseen, right? The parts that are not exposed, they deserve more honor. Any chance you get to say thank you. Every year we're like, how can we show these people we love them? How can we show our volunteers? Like, it, you know, if we could pay everybody, we would pay everybody, right? But we, there has to be a, a co-laboring and a co-honoring of one another. There is a cost in serving the body of Christ. There's a cost for those who have said yes. Oh, Father. Thank you, Jesus. All right. 1 Peter 2.17 says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Honor those that lead above you. Jim Ensign, he wrote this article. He states that in, our, in a current cultural moment of vitriolical debate and amplified voices in, in ubiquity, I know, big words. Basically, there's a lot of talk, Right? There's a lot of talk about what honor should be, who deserves it, who doesn't deserve it. And so when you begin to read this verse and, and it says honor everyone and, and honor those that um, love your brother and honor those that are over you, you want to ask Peter, like, are you sure? Did you really mean this, right? But the article goes on to say that during this time in the Asia Minor, they were struggling with the same things. It may not have been politics left and right. It may not have necessarily been as clear as the generational gap that we see right now. But there was this disparity of honor that was there. And Peter was like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to honor everybody. Honor is not just up. Honor is also across. Peter was saying to be your swords into plowshares and offer a gift of blessing by honoring everybody. Everybody wanted to preach and teach and do all these other things. And he's like, let's just start by learning the basics of what honor looks. To honor in this culture and in much of biblical writing was to do so with our words. It was what you said that would honor or shame someone. So quickly, here's a list on how do we honor someone 
even if we disagree with them. Honor is not agreement. You, you don't honor someone just because you agree with them. You can disagree with someone honorably. You can also choose to stop going back and forth and be honorable, right? But we honor people by speaking humbly and not just coming out there and telling them like it is and just showing off and make sure that they get it, right? We honor people because we speak kindly of them even when they're not there. There is a way that you can talk about your previous leaders that hurt you or whatever, and we know as you're talking there's a level of honor and you're just sharing what happened. We also know when there's a level of offense and bitterness by the position of your heart. It is possible to speak softly and still be dishonoring. So it's not about how loud your voice is. It's, it's, it's the words you use. It's how your face is. It's, it's the, the sentences that, that you're forming. So we can speak kindly of people that we don't agree with, right, and, and walk in honor. We speak knowing we may not have all the information. I think dishonor comes when we become dogmatic. When we feel like we have all of the information, then the way we present our arguments or whatever, it's like you possibly can't be right, which is a sign of pride. Honor always leaves room for humility. So I'm going to listen, I'm going to hear what you have to say, and then I'm going to say, have you possibly thought about it this way? Have you possi uh, possibly looked at it this way? We speak knowing it could be us, and we are in this, series, uh, in this season, everybody loves exposure. Oh, God is exposing the body of Christ. Oh, that leader is being exposed. That leader is being exposed. And I am there weeping, not only because that person is being exposed, but because it could be me. And that doesn't mean that I live a life of the, anything that I'm hiding. My life is an open book. It's transparent. We search our hearts. We make sure that there is no sin, overt, or covert. But the same person that you are pointing your finger at, and you're so grateful that God is exposing them, it also shows you that you have no fear of the Lord. Because at any moment, any moment, any moment, it could be you. So anytime I see somebody who's exposed, I say, God, search my heart. Oh, God, show me if there's anything wicked within me. Show me anything that I'm missing. Is it how I talk to people? Is it how I respond? Am I too defensive? Lord, show me, show me. Is there any wickedness in me, right? We don't, re we, we don't rejoice in iniquity. We don't rejoice when other people fall. So we speak understanding that we don't know it all. It could be a six. God can use anyone and anything. And so even if you disagree, is there anything in there that is making sense? And sometimes we have conversations and it's more so you learn um, more about that person than about the topic, right? But if you close them out and you close the idea out of possibly coming to a place of agreement or anything like that, it can be very, very difficult for you to be able to see him. Honoring someone means we pray for them. We pray for them even if we disagree with them, and that can be really difficult. Consider how we speak to them and about them in public and in private. Because, honey, you can honor somebody to somebody's face, but then when you get comfortable that your real feelings come out. I mean, we've had people, somebody met with my mom, and I don't know what happened during that lunch, but their, their real feelings about me came out. She came back shocked, right? But there's sometimes when we think that we're, we're putting on, we can't put on honor. It is who we are. It's not something that you can put on and take it off. You're either doing it or you're not. It means we believe the best about them, and we don't have to believe every word of gossip or slander. Get the facts. Get the facts before you run with information that you don't have totality. All right, let's keep going. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. 1 Peter 2.15. All right, let's go down here a little bit. Honor your spouse. Let marriage be held in honor among all. You will not be able to honor your spouse if you don't honor marriage. 
And so the beginning of honor within your marriage is understanding this ancient institution that God put together before you were even thought of for the propagation of society and for the, the, the multiplication of the kingdom of God. Marriage is way bigger than you. Marriage is not about what you like. It's not about what you want. It's about the kingdom of God advancing. That's why the enemy is so after it. He knows that if he can destroy marriages, he destroys families and families that are destroyed destroy societies and so when we honor marriage we reverence it we put it on a, on a pedestal we don't idolize it there's a possibility to there's, you can reverence and not idolize idolize means I worship it right reverence it is I understand its function and I understand that it's special I understand that it's different it's not common there's a scripture that talks about ves vessels that were used. There were common vessels and uncommon vessels, right? Marriage is not common. We don't just enter into it lightly. I joked and said we may need to start asking if there's anybody in the room that would say, you know, say no to this marriage, right? Because sometimes it's the person who's up there in the front, right? So when we understand that we're in a clad covenant, it is a clad iron agreement when you say I do as a believer. It is not a contract that unbelievers enter into that you can rip when your end of the deal has not been met. It is an ironclad covenant. There's room for multiple adulteries and, and cheat, you know, cheating and, and physical abuse and neglect, yes. But all this irreconcilable differences, that's not a thing in the kingdom. It's not a thing in the kingdom. So let me hurry up here. How do we honor? We honor the institution. And because we honor the institution and we have a reverence for it, then we treat our spouse in a reverential way. What does that mean? My husband is not like my brother. My husband is not like any of y'all. My husband is not even like my child. He is different. He is in a separate category. I cannot treat him common. I cannot talk to him common. I cannot act common around him because he is different. That's what honor is. Same thing about your wife. She is not your, your little girlfriend from down the street. She's not Becky with the good hair. Just kidding. Um, she's just not. This you have chosen to enter into a group and into an agreement. She's in a whole class of her own. That's why people be like, ah, oh, marriage ain't no big deal. You know, I've been with him for seven years. It is a big deal, baby girl. Everything changes. The moment you say, I do, everything changes. If you prepared well, it changes for the better. If you didn't, it's a little, you know, but it can all work out. Look, Pastor Elwood said, everything changes. We got it. We got it. We understand, sir. We got it. How long y'all been married? 27 years and they got married young so Matthew 6 21 says for where your treasure is y'all can start playing something uh, <laughs> where your treasure is there your heart will be also this verse suggests that honor is primarily a matter of the heart so in marriage it involves recognizing the beauty and the worth of your relationship with your spouse and then doing something to put recognition and appreciation to the action. You can't say I honor my spouse in words, but there is no action. There is nothing that you're doing to actually put them in a separate field. First Peter 3, 7 says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. You got to understand that we are special in more ways than one, right? And so with that, that better be a hundred dollar bill, boo. <laughs> They'll be coming up here and giving twenties. <laughs> Live your life <laughs> in, under, in an understanding way. We might be a little hard to understand, but this is why you need to put forth the work showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Some of you are like, I'm not the weaker vessel. I'm not. No, no, no. We're not talking about your intellect. We're talking about your body. I don't care. You cannot bench press what your, your husband bench presses unless he doesn't work out at all, right? Like, 
I was sharing there's a girl who turned herself into a man, went into the boxing ring with the man thinking she could box her, knocked out in 21 seconds. It doesn't matter how you change your appearance. You are a woman physically. We're made weak physically. Physically. And that's okay because that's why he's got to open the door for you. That's why he needs to make sure that you're not stepping in the rain puddle when the puddle is out there. That's why you don't need to carry no big bags because we're living in understanding. I am the weaker vessel. I am a delicate flower. You got to treat me a little bit differently than you would treat everybody else. And it doesn't matter how hard she acts. You got to keep going. Because she probably just has some walls. She has never had anybody treat her in this way, like a flower. Honor versus love. Honor and love are not the same thing. The difference is that love means to have a strong affection for someone. You can love someone and not honor them. Honor is to think highly. Is to respect highly. Is to show respect to recognize the importance or their spiritual value. I didn't get into the story about Jesus, how he goes into town and he wants to share and, and release miracles there like everywhere, everywhere else. But they say, oh, that's just the carpenter's son. And because they didn't esteem him, they didn't see him correctly. They were not able to experience the fullness of him. When we don't see people correctly, we don't experience the multi-dimensions of them. We don't experience the fullness of them. So how do you honor in marriage? And we're going to end here. Learn their love language. Listen to what they are saying. Listen and watch for things they would like or need. Don't be like, well, they didn't tell me nothing that they wanted, but are you paying attention? Right? Prioritize them over not only yourself, but everything else. It doesn't matter how much work you have. It doesn't matter how much responsibility you have. If your spouse doesn't feel like they're a priority, they're not going to feel honored. Care for your body. Because you are one body now. And our pastors, we talk about this stuff at the marriage retreat all the time. He had to grow a beard because she wanted a beard. He grew locks because she wanted locks because that's her body. That's what she wants. When you get in a marriage, you are in agreement. Y'all ain't ready for this. You ain't that, you ain't ready for that, that grown, grown marriage, right? I'd be like, babe, what? You, you shaved your beard, but you, we didn't talk about shaving our beard. <laughs> like, <laughs> I like that beard like that, you know, but you're one. It doesn't matter what nobody else likes or what you like. What does she like? Pastor Glenn was joking. He said, she likes big arms, so that's all he works out at the gym. He'd just be like this. That's all. <laughs> this is all she likes. This is all she wants, right? He's honoring her request. Honor their parents. Don't be like, oh, that's your mom and dad. You figure it out. Our mom lives in Africa. I said, okay, did we send a present? Did we send a monthly allowance? Is she okay? Should we build her a house, right? Like, his mom is my mom. There's no, oh, that's, that's, that's your family. That's your side of the family. Honor. By honoring their parents, you're honoring them. And then respect, love, and honor them. How do you show you're honorable? You respect them. You love them. And you honor them. You may stand on your feet. Thank you, Jesus. This, that's counseling. That's going to be $500 for this session. No, just honor someone near you. Honor someone who's serving. Honor your spouse. Lord, we thank you that we are honorable because you're honorable and we are like our daddy. And we are like our daddy. And we esteem others. We see their uniqueness and their gift and, and we give them the correct value for their sacrifice, for their placement in our lives, for who they are. Lord, we thank you for this church. We pray that, we thank you that every day we're learning what honor is. 
were learning that we, would, we were working to out-honor one another. That we would win in that game. We ask that you'd be glorified in all that we're doing. That we would show a fear and reverence of you in how well we love. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord a big hand. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. We honor God and we honor each other. It is, I know it's a hard um, self-reflecting, let me not use the word hard, but self-reflecting message. Um, it's one that we all in this room.